You're listening to The Business Communicators, presented by IABC Houston. And now your hosts, Austin Stanton, Hattie Horn, and Thomas Bain. Welcome to season three, episode eight of the Business Communicators podcast presented by IBC Houston. My name's Austin Staten here alongside my co-host Hattie Horn and Thomas Bain. We are coming at you from the other side, the other side of 2020. We are finally in 2021 and you are listening to this episode, hopefully when it's released, which is Monday, January 11th. And we hope the first 11 days of the year have been good for you. And if not, you know, there's still 350 plus more days in the year. So just <laughs> keep motivated, keep moving forward. But uh, we're really excited to be here in 2021. And before we get things started, we do want to remind you that you can follow us on social media. Just search at Biz Communicator on all of our platforms. Uh, I think we're on everything but TikTok. I make that joke all the time. Um, but we also uh, have a way for you to give us feedback. You can shoot us a text message message, just send podcasts to 713-360-0133. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. We'll, you know, send you show notes, anything that you want. We'll help you out there. Also, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, leave us a review. That really helps us out. We want to hear feedback, comments, critiques, anything, just let us know. But most importantly, we launched a website, thebusinesscommunicators.com. We will link it in the show notes below. We are going to have some amazing things coming your way over the next few weeks. And so we hope that you enjoy it. But Thomas, Hattie, how was the, uh, you know, the the holidays? Did Santa bring you everything you want? How was the New Year's celebration? Did you get enough college football? How's everything going? Everything's going really well for me. I had a, I'd like to say an uneventful holiday. Um Nothing horrible happened during the holiday, as we know. All That's always BS. a good thing. <laughs> Ate more than I needed to. But other than that, it was really, really good. Uh, you know, it's great. And now that actually living in Houston where we were wearing shorts on Christmas Day and a cool front blew through. And so that's kind of nice to actually be wearing long sleeves at this time. Um, uh, I think my kiddos got everything. In fact, on our walk this morning, my daughter was like, I wish we could have Christmas every day. And I'm like, I don't think our bank account can handle that. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's the kids belief in the joy that you see. And I told her, I'm, I'm more than happy to start wrapping presents and someone might be rock. Someone might be stick. Someone might be a Lego, but you know, it, it's the joy and the smile that they have and, and getting to spend time with y'all because, you know, the margaritas were definitely very good that we got to get together and to see each other practicing social distancing. Uh, so it, it warmed my heart on that aspect. Yeah, it was so much fun. Uh, we posted on our social media page a photo of all three of us outside of Ninfa's. We went to, uh, we went there, I think it was right before Christmas uh, yeah. that we went there and it was a lot of fun. We were, I, I think it was funny. We show up at one o'clock and next thing I know, I look down at my phone, I'm like, oh, it's almost time for dinner. <laughs> 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 it's 4.30, but that's how it was when we got together. We had some margaritas, we had a good time and uh, we did it all safely outdoors. But we hope that you are all staying safe. Um, during these times, I know COVID-19 is definitely rearing its ugly head again, uh, especially here in Houston, as it was announced on Thursday that the uh, the new strain, the UK strain of uh, COVID-19 is now in our city. So hopefully the vaccines come soon. Uh, hopefully we can be recording in person soon, um, but we just have to get over uh, these next few weeks. But unfortunately, we're broadcasting this episode just a few days before the inauguration uh, in, in less than a week after chaos struck the Capitol. And if you're not familiar with what we're talking about, you probably have been living under a rock, but I think a lot of people anticipated on January 6th that there were going to be protests in Washington, DC for a lot of people who didn't want to accept the results of the 2020 US election. And there was violence. Five people, as of when we're recording this podcast, have died as a result of the uh, you know domestic terrorism, the violence that happened inside the Capitol, people destroying property, federal property, just outright horror. And the president of the United States, Donald Trump, sent out some tweets, basically egging this on. He sent out a video saying that these people were very fine people and that he loved his patriotic supporters. Social media finally took a stand against the president. I know there have been calls for years to have him deplatformed. Facebook deplatformed him. President Trump is indefinitely banned from Facebook, Instagram. The only platform that he's back on right now is Twitter. He tweeted on Thursday night an updated statement, if you will, regarding the situation in Washington, D.C. And we definitely don't 
want to make this a political episode. We want this to be relevant in communications and why it's important. And we kind of discussed beforehand on whether or not we should even mention this on the podcast, but we wanted to because of the communications angle and how important it is that the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, who has been addicted to social media and using that platform as a tool to reach his base, his voters, his supporters, has now been deplatformed. I don't think that I anticipated him actually being deplatformed. I don't think that I saw Facebook doing it. I don't think that I saw Twitter doing it, but it happened. Hattie, what are your thoughts? I'm like you. I didn't expect it to happen. And now that it has happened, um, my expectations is that um, he's deplatformed under that name. I wonder, is he going to come back in a different name like so many people do? Well, they can be banned from certain platforms and things like that, but they come back. But what for me is about the words, those words, his words reach so many people who believe in what he has to say. It talks a lot about influence, um, whether it's negative, which it clearly is. And the way it was communicated, people read between those lines and they interpreted that the way they wanted to interpret it. And they took action in a way that was horrible, embarrassing, just and, and deadly. And, and that's just not acceptable as far as I'm concerned. Now, as for him being back on Twitter, um, he's, I think he's gonna continue to say what he wants to say. Um, he may try to um, use code words, but whatever he says, the people that are a part of his, and I'm gonna say a gang, cause that's almost like it was, is a gang are gonna do whatever he says. And that's really, really sad. People who listened to him were hurt because of what he said. People weren't hurt, they were killed. And I yes, think that's very course. important to distinct is that President Trump has the most influential Twitter account in the world. He has 87, million followers sorry 88.7 million followers is the time that we're recording this episode when he tweets the markets move yeah uh it's just amazing the amount of power that he has at the you know his thumb we actually did a um, um when i say we my company we issued a press release about a fuels donation jet fuels donation uh early on during COVID 19. We had a lot of congressional members, both Republicans, Democrats, retweet it, thank us for doing it. President Trump actually retweeted our account. He didn't do a quote retweet. It was just a plain retweet. Um, but the amount of engagement that we had as a result of that was absurd, you know, just because of him. We did some research, pulled some numbers together, worked with the third party agency, Purple Strategies in Washington, D.C., to come up with a number, a dollar figure on how much his retweet was worth. And we valued it that we would have to do the equivalent of a $1 million ad buy to be able to give that kind of an exposure on, on social media. So a million dollars in paid support on a Twitter ad would have gotten that, us the same exposure. That That's just insane. That's Thomas, powerful. It, it, it's very powerful. And, and Thomas, curious on your end, what is your take on this whole situation, deplatforming? Was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? Is it still too early to tell? Presidents having love-hate relationships with any sort of media platform, any sort of uh, going out has, has been there for years and years and years, going all the way back to Jefferson. Um, if you watch the movie Hamilton, it talks about uh, the political scandal that kept him from running for office. Uh, so this isn't new. Um, but, but it does kind of come back to that, uh, that, that old adage of yelling fire in a movie theater. Does it incite a riot? And, and, and that law was passed in the 1918, 1917, early 1900s before the only, really before the only media then was newspapers. And even those was more limited. They were still doing the stump speeches and driving around on trains. Um, it, it's almost like the, the government or somebody needs to step in and say, this is really a news platform. This is really a communications platform. It needs... And, and I hate to say it, it needs some sort of reg regulations on it. Um, one of our old pat, our old uh, podcast guests, uh, Mandy Kane uh, from PRSA in Nashville, 
uh, over dinner one night when she was in town recording the podcast, uh, her and I and Austin had the conversation about how do we help prevent the fake news? How do we help prevent the inciting of mass hysteria? And, and is it time for IBC, PRSA, AMA, and all the professional organizations to come together and to kind of form some sort of certification? Not, not to silence the social medias, but to, to, to help rein in on who's being able to put out the media and you know whether it's cut on price breaks on ad buys or promoted tweets or something along those lines um but but this but this really just shows the power of influencer marketing and we talked about it before while yes donald trump with his gazillion followers can move markets but so can those minor ones and so those those face-to-face selling points and those things come in back into play i think that as an obligation as an elected official We've said it, think before you tweet, think before you post, think before you do anything. It's an obligation to truly understand what's going on and what you're going to say has implications to the grand scheme of things. You mentioned influencers, and I think it's worth bringing up influencers in this case because influencers, they do have the ability to sell products, right? Uh, There's a reason why people pay Charlie D'Amelio $100,000 per TikTok post, but she just sells products. President Trump literally moves the stock market. If he were to tweet out that, I don't know, Tesla is being banned from the United States, Tesla's stock would crash. Elon Musk, who was just named the richest person in the world, his net worth would fall. Uh, The markets would be probably paused, you know, for a bit to allow for that correction. Uh, So there's a difference between being an influencer, one that can sell and peddle products to someone who can literally change the face of the planet at the snap of his fingers. And I think that's something to differentiate. And there was an article that was posted by Sarah Fisher. She's a media reporter for Axios. She covers all of this. Um, She posed the question whether this was too little too late. You know, I think that there's been a lot of people that have uh, been very critical of the things that President Trump has, you know, done on social media. And ironically, our very first podcast episode, season one, episode one was with Sarah Fisher. And we spoke on the weaponization of social media and how that could be horrible in the hands of a bad actor. So we asked her a few questions and we'll link this into the the show notes, but you can go back and, and listen to it. But we spoke on the rise of social media and it's used by politicians and mass influencers. Is it here to stay? Uh, what digital practices should businesses be doing when engaging with the public figures? Does social media just crush print media moving forward? So I, I think the weaponization of social media is here. We've seen bad actors use it. Uh, especially abroad in third world countries, but now we're seeing bad actors use it to mobilize violence here in the United States. And I don't like that. But it's all about who it benefits and what it benefits. That's why some people get away with it. We talk about him being this huge influence and him able to influence the planet and the world. What's really scary is he's got a lot of supporters out there who are benefiting from those words whether, you know, carefully crafted or thoughtlessly thrown out. Those are the things that uh, words as weapons on, on platforms are being used now. But people have used words as weapons for years. Absolutely. I think something that I heard on Friday morning that kind of made me raise my eyebrows a little bit was that People now with social media, whether it's politicians, influencers, celebrities, whoever, even just, you know, Susie and Sam who live in your neighborhood, Mm -hmm. does social media make people performative? Hmm. I I think that I I think that it's the ability to hide behind it is the people who are uh, pushing these agendas. They're they're no longer in the public face. Um, Social media being weaponized is, again, it goes back to it's not a new concept. Militaries around the world have departments of propaganda, right. departments of communications. Um, there was a really cool article that I saw, um, I think last week, where it was talking about um, after World War II, the United States was trying to return a bunch of the artwork that was captured from the Nazis. And they were having to go through and say, 
is this propagandist? Is this going to start a riot? And if it was yes, then it stays in the troves. They weren't destroying it. They're just keeping it from releasing it back out into the public. Um, and so I, I don't know if social media is ever going to overtake um, print media. I don't think social media is ever going to overtake television media. I don't think social media is ever going to overtake radio. I think that there, there's still that balancing act that needs to take place. Um, of which who's using what. And I think that the, the media places need to know and understand who's reading what and what level of integrity needs to go into each one of them. You know, it, it's no longer, hey, we need to get to the story first because it's going to be released on social media, whether it's accurate or not. I think that each level needs to be on that level of accuracy. Um, you know, we were discussing 60 Minutes, probably one of the more respected news, news programs in the United States because they do so much back-end research on everything. When it comes to social media, we've said this thousands of times, think then tweet, words do matter. They are very, very important. And if you are deciding that you want to break a federal law and break into Nancy Pelosi's office, here's a pro tip. Don't live stream it on your Twitch. Don't live stream it on Facebook Live. I could not believe how many people were doing it for a photo op so they could get some extra likes on social media. Now the FBI is looking after them. And it's been so hilarious to me to see like a before and after photo of there, there was this, I hope it wasn't Photoshop, but there was this, this father, I think in Indiana, his son broke into the Capitol posed next to a statue with the Trump flag and his father saw the photo and it was it was shared on social media by a news outlet. And he posted, that's my boy. <laughs> like, so proud of him. Four hours later, why is the FBI contacting me? He posts on Twitter. Next morning, his account's gone. Uh, so people don't realize that when you post something out there on social media, even if you think it's private, it's not private. People I don't think anybody it. was thinking. And of course not. And I'm going to say this, um, that I've seen some journalists and I agree with saying people don't have a fear of the police. They think nothing is going to happen to them because they've never had a fear of law enforcement and people. So they feel free to put whatever they want out there. Sometimes I just think, man, social media is on ADHD. What's going on out there? People have lost their minds. But when you don't have a fear of what you communicate or the words that you say, or the fact that you need to think before you tweet, it's not gonna matter. It's interesting because, you know, I'd like to see the average age because I know I've mentioned several times, not just to y'all, but just in general, that I'm so glad that when I was growing up and in college that camera phones were not a thing and uh, other stuff. Not that I, I, I broke, broke the laws, but it was just one of those things that stupid kids doing stupid kid stuff. Um, I do vividly remember being in, uh, in, a, in a social fraternity and people would get post MIPs or other things because they'd go through the party time pictures where they'd come to the different parties, take pictures and, you know, the known minors with the big old black X's on their hands with beer cans in their hands. And then magically they'd get a ticket for it. Um, but that was also before all the photo editing. And it just, it, and, it, and it goes to show that don't live tweet it. Don't, don't, don't give ammunition to say I'm breaking the law. And here's the evidence that I'm breaking the law. And I know that people do that all the time. I, I think sometimes that's that's a negative thing. Sometimes we're too open and we want to share our lives too much. And I think that's sometimes a bad thing. I mean, I think there are things that we should keep private. If you look at Joe Rogan, for example. He is a very public person when it comes to his podcast. His wife and three kids, like nobody knows anything about him because he keeps his family life private. I think that's commendable. Even though he has such a massive, massive audience, he's still able to maintain that level of privacy. I remember in college, you know, we would we would drink, you know, we would drink on weekends, even when we were underage. Sorry, mom. Sorry, dad. Uh, but any type of photo that was taken, you know, people, we weren't taking cell phone photos because nobody had cameras. But, you know, the, the point and shoot cameras, if anyone was taking a photo, you always do this move where you put the drink behind your back. I think that was 
something that we did. We were cognizant of that 10, 15 years ago. And I just don't understand why people are so open to sharing every single moment of their lives. Because the platforms allow it, Austin. Operative word, it's called social. Social media. They create them to be social. And people literally use those, (laughs) take advantage of that. Uh, And they're not thinking about that. We can talk about, there are adults, old as Methuselah out there, putting everything, including, you know, their dentures out on social media uh, because there's just no thought or consider for or consideration for other people I, because I can do it. I have the platform to do it. Here it is. Boom. I'm putting it out there. With, Thomas was saying something about regulating how we communicate out on social medias, but you're also going to need to think about, do you rebrand what the platforms are about. So that's a whole nother conversation. You know, and, and I was going to go back about, you know, Austin's statement about hiding the hiding the beer behind your back or making sure there's no <laughs> beer in there. There are certain things that I personally enjoy watching that, that I know that they're breaking the law, like the cannonball run that broke, the record was broke like twice during the pandemic because yeah. there was nobody on the roads. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, I recommend it. And also there's an underground live cannonball runs where they actually try to do it. And the record actually just fell a couple couple months ago twice. But but media and technology is so cheap. Um, we, we've said that about uh, the AR and the VR and the flight simulators and everything. It, is that it's in it's in it's in Congress right now about breaking up Google and breaking up Facebook, um, Twitter's being thing. Um, it, it takes a snap of a finger and a high school teenager kid or even a junior high kid to create a new social media platform. It's not as hard as it used to be. The computing power is phenomenal in our phones. So, so, so it, it comes down to, but, but when they started to try to monetize it, I think that's where we have to kind of step in and say, okay, this is what's going to go on. You know, the number of followers you get, you're always going to have those followers. Um, but, but for businesses, you're going to pay to play and it's the advertising and it's the media and it's when the media jumps onto a falsified article and it just snowballs. You know, a, a small little tweet, a small little Facebook post gets some traction and then the media gets it and then it just gets a bigger traction and then it gets more traction and gets more traction and more traction. I think that's where the challenge, I think that's where um, these companies should be looking at how, not, not how to regulate it, but just how to make it a safe place, yeah. a, a safe platform. Yeah, social media can definitely go unchecked and rumors can run rampant. We've seen rumors spread like wildfire. On the platforms we've seen even even this week you look at the the rumors surrounding kanye west that are spreading because of TikTok. i mean it, it, it's it's mind-blowing to me to see some of these rumors about him and an alleged affair um you know they could be true they, they might not be true but people are taking viral TikTok videos and now passing them off as fact and it's it's just crazy but here's my takeaway just because you can share something doesn't mean that you should share it. And I think that's an important lesson to, to think whether you are an individual or company. And this last week, we also saw companies make some pretty huge mistakes. And one of the companies was Pizza N. And you might be wondering, why are we talking about Pizza N on the Business Communicators podcast? Well, they decided to insert themselves into a conversation in which they had no business getting involved in. And on Tuesday, I think it was January 5th, they issued a press release via PR Newswire, which cost $2,800 to be able to issue a press release on that platform. They sent a release weighing into the election and voter fraud. And they said, quote, millions of Americans believe that widespread voter fraud may have changed the results of the presidential election." We believe this is probable, but the fact that we can't say for certain is what concerns us most. They go on to further say in the press release, they are not constitutional scholars, but then proceed to give six things that they would do to change how we vote in this country. What the hell was Pizza N thinking? 
that they didn't have enough pineapple for their pizza. Who knows? Uh, they weren't thinking clearly, that was for sure. Um, I think what gives me pause is that for them not being an ex, you know, saying they weren't an expert in this particular area and then proceeding to tell folks how it needed to be done. So many parallels to were they playing a part in this whole week's chaos and cray cray that went along too. I looked at their share price information and their parent company Rave, they are a publicly traded company. They have been delisted twice in the past six months by NASDAQ and their same store sales for the last quarter fell 22%. And I know that the general restaurant industry has been hurting, but takeout and delivery like this hasn't been hurting. If you look at their competitors, such as like Papa John's, which we discussed earlier in season three, their same store sales are up 20% during that same time period. So I think this was a publicity stunt that just the timing couldn't have been more awful. And, and, and I saw the same news about them getting delisted off the NASDAQ. And, and the reason they're delisted is because their share price fell below a dollar and it stayed there for a long time. Um, and so, so I have no, no doubt in my mind that this was a publicity stunt trying to get some quick wins to get it above a dollar so they weren't delisted. Um, and then I also kind of quickly just Googled just now while Austin was talking about where they're located. Pizza Inn isn't necessarily a big city pizza chain. Um, it, it's, it's in the small, and I just only made it through Texas to where they're in the smaller towns. Um, so, so he might be trying to play to his, his base or, or their customer base for those rural, rural areas. But again, I think, I think that Pizza Inn at the end of the day was trying to increase their share price to above a dollar. And that was the whole reason they did it. I don't think it worked. I know it didn't work because they're still not above a dollar and they still got delisted. Um, and it looks like it's still falling. So it's probably gonna fall even more because of this. So so it's it, it's a complete miss. Yeah. So is it safe to say they're gonna go out of business? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's plausible. They might have to file for bankruptcy. I mean, their share price as of <laughs> January 8th is trading at 89 cents. I mean, it's not good. But one of the other issues that I had with this whole situation is there was a Dallas-based PR company, Champion Management, that had Pizza Inn as their client. And they approved, they, they, they sent the press release out to PR Newswire. And I'm questioning that from an ethical standpoint. You know, we've got the IBC Code of Ethics, which says that members must communicate accurate information and promptly correct any errors. PRSA's Code of Ethics says that we must convey the following on honesty that we adhere to the highest standards of accuracy and truth in advancing the interest of those we represent and in communicating with the public. So take that note. In those that we represent. So that means if you're a PR agency and you've got a client, you still have to follow those ethics. When you've had 60 court cases say that there is no voter fraud and none of these court cases have gone anywhere and you still send out a press release, whether you wrote it or not, you still send this out, you're culpable at the end of the day. I think one of the issues that I also have is that this is a day before all the violence in DC. So I think both parties, in my opinion, are somewhat to blame for peddling conspiracy theories that help lead to people rioting and destroying federal property this, this past week in Washington, DC. I agree on that. They are complicit. At the same time, don't try to backpedal out of it at the last minute. And this is, that's the whole thing going on even you know that past week. Things went wrong. People start backpedaling, <laughs> trying to distance themselves from the situation because whatever they tried failed fast. Yeah. Sometimes you take a risk like a publicity stunt and it backfires in your face. I, I just, to me, it, it blows my mind. And Thomas, I know you were trying to jump in there. You know, a it, 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 couple things. F first off is is we're in the First Amendment. We've talked about, I've mentioned earlier in this podcast about certifications and licensing and et cetera. But there's no, there's no rule, hard, fast rule that a PR firm or an advertising firm um, has to be a member of the reputable organizations, whether it's PRSA, AMA, AdFed, IABC. And so do they really have to follow those guidelines? The answer is really no, but should they? Yes. But, but then also at the back end of it, 
um, running your own company, there's a whole lot of back and forth that goes from there. I don't know what uh, the firm's uh, billings are and if uh, Pizza Inn or Rave is a small percentage of their billings or a large percentage of their billings. And, and then also, you know, there might be some sort of opt-out clause because if you're hiring a PR firm and you have a PR firm on retainer, they're there for crisis management. And so you don't want them to be able to say, eh, without cause, we're gone. And so, so I think that at the end of the day, the, the owner of the PR firm needs to really sit down and look at their, their, their portfolio of business. Are, do they have the right mix? Do they have the right ethos? Do they have the right clients they're going after? Um, you know, you hear so many people saying, we're not going to take the sin stocks, the, the tobacco, alcohol, firearms, petroleum, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. But should there be some sort of clause that if you don't listen to the advice we give you, we're firing you on the spot as a PR firm, not, not just as the client firing the, the, the agency. Yeah. So, so without having the full back end story, I, 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 my heart bleeds for the owner of the PR firm, but at the same token, he should have known better. Yeah, I, I agree. And he really should have. He's the owner of a PR firm. You, yeah, you have to set your company up for success because at the end of the day, he, like he we make, he's paid a lot of money to make those decisions. Right. We we discussed the Richards Group earlier this year and why their mistakes cost that company millions of dollars, potentially put jobs at risk. I was curious about Champion Management, a little bit about their firm. And according to their website, their values say that the company, quote, won't represent a client whose products or services we don't believe in or that are detrimental to the good of society. So I wanted to reach out to Lad Bureau, who is the principal and founder of Champion Management, to get his take on the situation to see if they had any regrets. Um, I asked if they were still partnered with Pizza Inn, if they were still a client, if they supported their work in the press release. And I did get a statement back from Lad. I'll go ahead and read that right now and put it up on the screen. But Lad said that at Champion, we pride ourselves on being an indispensable partner to our clients. We strongly counseled Pizza Inn against putting out the recent press release. I personally warned that it would backfire on the brand and potentially disenfranchise half of its customers. And that Brandon, the CEO of Pizza Inn, would likely be polarized and in the media. I also shared my opinion that they would be stoking the flames of a very divisive issue at just the wrong time. I was not successful in my argument. He went on to say that I considered refusing the directive from a longtime client, but in the end, we put aside our personal beliefs and fulfilled our responsibility as their agency partner. In hindsight, this was a mistake. We should have refused and taken the risk of being fired. We have since terminated our engagement with Pizza Inn and disassociated ourselves from their views on this issue. And then specifically on the IBC and PRSA code of ethics, Lad said that the release accurately states Pizza Inn's position on this issue. It is certainly not champion's position, but our job is to communicate our client's position. He also said, since we have terminated our relationship with Pizza Inn and disavowed their position on this issue, we have no say in any potential retraction. What are your thoughts? He had a Pence moment. Mike Pence moment. I have no doubt that he regrets what he did. I, I'm, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that. However, it's unfortunate that he was unable to influence the client. I don't know what his relationship is with the client. It seems like it goes further than just being professional for him not to be able to get them in. And he could, he didn't refuse, but they quickly backpedaled after the fact when the storm hit. I'm disappointed in how they handled it, but I don't wish them any harm or anything. And I, I hope they're able to regroup and recoup. So we'll see. The thing that gets me is their name is on the press release. Anybody the contact the too on the newswire, and, and so so while he might backpedal and, and reading as Austin read his the, their their mission, vision, values, uh, code of ethos, nothing does it say dealing with a, a a owner who's going to try to go off the reservation a little bit. Um, the last I checked, pizza still falls into the good categories of businesses to do to do business with. Yeah, it, it's I, I wish them the best. I hope they're well. Um, Googling their, their website, it looks like they've already pulled Pizza Inn off their website. And it does look like that they have a fair amount of, 
of uh, business still into it. Looks like they actually specialize in restaurants, so that makes it even more entertaining. If you look at their website also, it says that they don't deal with jerks. They said no jerks or junk. Um, so I don't know. I am I understand they made a mistake, and we're not about cancel culture here. Um, you know, we have, we've all made mistakes. We've got to own up to it. Our, our point of this podcast is to discuss how we would do things different, why we would, how we would approach something in this scenario. We understand that we don't understand. We don't know the contract details. We, you know, there, there might not have been a way that they could refuse. I will just say this. If you are a PR agency, you've got a client that you significantly d- disagree with, and you know that it could be a potential reputation risk for that client. It's also a reputation risk for your company as well. You're putting your company and your employees and your staff in the crosshairs at the end of the day. I think that this should have been outright refused. I, I kind of agree with Hattie that this is a Mike Pence moment, that this is a, a hindsight is 2020, that we were called out and we regret doing it. I think that if you are confident in your firm, you've got to be able to put the foot down and say no. And I think that falls on leadership. And I was actually curious how other companies would have handled the situation and if any other companies have gone through a similar situation. And I reached out to a, uh, a mentor of mine and asked him, you know, basically the same questions, like, what would you guys do in this situation? And he responded, we actually just fired a major client a month ago for getting us into an ethical quandary. We, we would never advise a client to take such action, even in the spirit of being provocative. There are long-term, long-tail implications to such activities. We practice, quote, do no harm communications. We have passed on dozens and dozens of clients. Oh, it just clicked out. We have passed on dozens and dozens of clients over the years that they wanted to use us to smear competitors or venture into gray areas of truth, which I think this was a gray area of truth, 100%, this, this press release. It's one reason why we don't take on political candidates as clients, for example. Our reputation is our currency and nurturing reputations is our trade. If you knowingly betray the truth, you won't get as far as an agency. Like the Richards Group example, which was unfortunate, taking such measures also erodes culture and behavioral standards from the inside out. The wrong talent thrives and the good talent leaves. Lastly, many of our agent brethren have their hands forced because of the relative importance and revenue concentration of one client. If it's the bulk of your business, the ethics bar could possibly possibly be lowered. You have to manage the portfolio wisely to avoid giving a client too much power over the agency. Uh, he also said that one of his mentors said to him before passing away that you have to figuratively or sometimes physically Grab the client by the shoulders and tell them, this is wrong. We will be on the losing side and our agency won't be a party of it. I hope you respect or understand our relationship enough to get that. I thought that was incredible. I thought that was very measured. It was a peek into how this person's company handles situations like that. I think that champion management should have had a backbone. And I understand they made a mistake. I understand they regret the mistake. I understand that they've separated their partnership with Pizza End. But you've got to have a backbone to stand up for your ethics and your corporate values. I agree. And practice do no harm communications. You know, I'm going to commend uh, the person you reach out to um, and the agency that that they're operating like a, a, a... not a first amendment, not a communications firm, but as a real business driver, business stations, everything like that. Um, one of the startup companies I'm work for, I'm actually in the process of interviewing attorneys um, for contract law. And, and so having to do the due diligence on the back end of it and reminds me of a video I saw literally last week of one of them, you know, in their little FAQ thing. And it says, uh, what happens if one of your clients asks you to do something illegal? And, and, and they said, it's in our policy that we fire them immediately on the spot. And it's the same concept. What happens if you ask us to do something athletic, unethical? We fire you on the spot. It, it, it's, there's no gray area to that point. Um, and so, so I, I commend that. Um, I think as professionals, we need to always be trying to do what's best for 
our client what's best for society. Um, and, and not necessarily in that order, just it, it's, it, it's, you can't have one without the other period. Yeah. I do want to say that I commend Lad Bureau for, you know, breaching back out, giving us a statement and owning up to the mistake. I think that that is admirable of him. I just hope that, you know, they can keep that in mind moving forward, that sometimes your reputation matters more than anything else. And you can't associate with companies that have, that are, that are pushing conspiracy theories like this. You know, it, it's the same thing of if you get in a car and you know, the person driving is drunk and you don't do anything to stop it. Even if you weren't driving and that person got in a wreck and hurt somebody, you're still responsible. Like you, you, legally you might not be responsible, but at the end of the day, you could have stopped something. You could have stopped something bad from happening. So my, my advice to Lad is again, thank you for giving us that statement. Pause and think moving forward. What is best for my company? What is best for my people? What is best for my reputation? Don't get into any situations like this that could lower your credibility as a company. Well, I'm not going to give him any advice because he looks like he's old enough to know better. However, uh, again, I do agree thinking before doing something and I don't know what he was thinking. He, he trust your gut. He, he said he had a gut feeling. If you have a gut feeling about something, don't do it. I'm going to give him a little bit of, of, of of, of praise just because during the whole Richards group thing, we said as an agency, as an advisor, it's a bad news day when your name is more of the story than your client's name is. And, and outside of us being professionals, I don't think many people are tying the dots between his agency and pizza in. So whether that's because the media got distracted with something way bigger taking over the, <laughs> over the government, or if it's, or, or if it's a very strategic play, I'm, I'm only commending that he's not the story outside of us very targeted professionals who can read between the lines. Um, so, so you Google it, it's really hard to find that from his agency released the press release. And again, it might be dumb luck, might be planned. It's just a happy coincidence on him. And so I'm going to give him a shrewd. little props for that. We're going to tell him he's shrewd. <laughs> I, I do think it's a little bit of luck. <laughs> I do think it's a little bit of luck because the press release ultimately was pulled from PR Newswire. Um, you can still find it on a few different publications, but yeah, I, I do think it's a little bit of luck, especially because there was a major, major event, um, a, a huge event that impacts the credibility of our country that happened less than 12 hours after. Uh, so I think that kind of kind of helps. It's, it's, it's why my alma mater, Baylor University, sent out a press release on Super Bowl Sunday a few years ago. It's because they knew people weren't going to be talking about it. But sometimes you see press releases come across, come across the wire and you kind of raise an eyebrow. This is one of them. And I think with the events that followed the very next day, that just exacerbated it, in, in my opinion. Um, I, I think that if, if, if nothing would have happened in D.C., people wouldn't have talked about it. We wouldn't have spoken about it on this episode. But I personally believe that if you are peddling conspiracy theories, you're part of the problem. That, that's my take. Take it or leave it. I don't care. Republican, Democrat, whatever, independent. That's my take. If you're peddling conspiracy theories, you're part of the problem. And don't be a part of the problem. Be a part of the solution. Let's move forward together as a country, uh, especially as once we get to the inauguration on January 20th. I hope we can do that. I'm sure Austin's going to write a big blog about this on our new website. <laughs> what is um, the website, the Thomas? <laughs> com. And on that note, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Pierpont Communications and Mike Krantz and Company. Um, who helped make this this podcast uh, available for all of us. So thank you to them. Um, look forward to the website and Austin's blog. <laughs> <laughs> My vlog. Yeah, Push. you're you're funny. You're funny. It's it it. You know, I did dabble a little bit into social media over the holidays. Uh, my dad's got a cat. My parents have a cat that they absolutely love. The cat's probably I don't know, a year and a half, two years old. And my dad started an Instagram account for the cat. And he had no idea how to like use hashtags. He was just posting photos, not not tagging, not even making comments, nothing. I was like, Dad, you gotta you gotta step up your game a little bit. Maybe even get Bo on TikTok. So I started a TikTok account for my parents' cats. And 
the cat has like 500 followers within the first week uh has 3000 likes on the video i mean i don't know maybe maybe my parents me we could make that a, a new side hustle you know make 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 money off the cat doing stupid things i don't know don't discount it <laughs> <laughs> it has been fun i'll tell you that just to kind of see how the platform <laughs> works I, I have a French bulldog. My wife's and he's seven years old. And we're like, why don't we start a, a, a Instagram account for him back then? But then it also reminds me of a, of a, of a speech that I heard the owner of uh, Carbach Brewery, Brock Wagner, for about a year, year and a half, they changed the name of one of their beers to the Wagger, um, which they're given some of the, the donations to the Humane Society. And he said that the sales went through the roof. And he said, so here's your business takeaway. Put an animal on it and your sales will go up. So Austin, keep going with the cat. <laughs> I will definitely keep going with the cat, but <laughs> I think I think today was a um, more of a serious episode than some of the fun ones that we've done in the past. But I think um, you know that the biggest news story in the world had a direct communications impact this week, and and we had to cover it. And uh, we're going to do things you know a little bit differently. We're not going to be 100 serious all the time. We want to be serious in how we discuss communications, but in terms of the sensitivity of some of these issues that are going on globally. We're not going to, you know, dive into them on a week in week out basis. You know, we're not a current events podcast We're we're a, a podcast that discusses communications trends, things that are going on within our industry and how they impact you as communicators. So we hope that, you know, today's show is relevant. If uh, you think so, give us a follow on social media at biz communicator. You can also uh, leave us feedback on iTunes. You can leave us feedback on our website, thebusinesscommunicators.com. Or if you want, you can uh, actually just shoot us a text and our, our phone number is 713-360-0133. Just shoot podcast uh, to that number, 713-360-0133. And, and let us know what you think. Let us know if you have any show ideas, topic ideas. We've actually got a, you know some fun episodes coming up. Uh, next week, we're going to be uh, interviewing a, uh, a DJ and producer, who uh, actually is getting a huge start to his career because of TikTok and social media. And I think that's going to be an absolutely fascinating conversation. And then Hattie booked us a, a great conversation. Hattie, do you want to tell us a little bit about that in two weeks? Oh, yeah. In two weeks, we're going to talk to Chris Brogan. Chris Brogan is a influential marketer, has a huge following, and he works with a lot of big companies and brands um to move them forward so I'm looking forward to that because I followed him for a while and I rediscovered him recently and so I'm excited that we're going to be having him on the on the on the show well that's what we do we come into 2021 hot we've got two great guests coming up the next week so we hope that you tune in for that well as always it's been great being able to record the podcast with you all this week and we hope that our listeners enjoyed today's episode and that you learned something as well. Maybe something you could that you can take to your corporate job or your PR agency, because we think that these are very important lessons and that all communicators should know. You should always be learning. You should always be growing. I think that's so, so critical for us to be able to advance and, uh, you know, really embrace that professional development. But on behalf of my co-hosts this week, Hattie Horn and Thomas Bain, my name's Austin Staten. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to The Business Communicators. 